So uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'm certainly going to uh, introduce Lieutenant Kevin. I want to kick that off by saying that uh, back when the Baker Blue administration uh, came into office a little north of four years ago now, uh, at the center of what the Lieutenant Governor wanted to do was connect back with municipalities on establishing best practices. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Lieutenant Governor has experience as a former select person in the uh, community of Massachusetts. I, from my perspective, gives them an opportunity to understand what we do every day and uh, really important thing. So uh, the focus on the community compact program was to find those best practices. It was really interesting throughout the Commonwealth, depending on the size of the organization, the structure of the organization, everybody needs, um, has different needs, right? Some of those, quite frankly, struggle with trying to put together a budget. Some people have technology needs and then other communities do a lot of that really well, but they need uh, a more specific needs like some of our needs here that we'll talk about briefly. So the Community Compact Program links state government uh, with the opportunity to develop best practices. And with that, as the communities develop and implement those best practices, they get acknowledged through our increased opportunity for grant funding. So in addition to benefiting the community with they work, uh, the state incentivizes them through the opportunity grant program. This has been at the center of uh, County Governor Polito's initiatives to link state government to local government, something that I think, in fairness, uh, for someone who's been around the block a little bit in local government, we felt had been missing for a long time. A lot of conversation about, hey, the state needs to help local government empower local government. Um, they've brought that to a reality. The Baker Police Administration has been instrumental in making sure that we have someone to call, uh, someone to get a response from, and someone who can provide the resources that we just not always get the resources. So we very much appreciate that. We had a first community compact signed about Two years ago, uh, we made it through that. So at the end of the community compact process, you developed a pretty simple report that shows the Commonwealth that you've complied with that compact, and we did that a couple of years ago. And with that, uh, we started to have some conversations with IT Director Chris McClure about things we could look at from a IT side, a public safety side, as part of round two. And we recently applied to do that, um, and we have put in two new initiatives under a new community compact which will execute the Commonwealth. Uh, one of those which we'll talk most about is the continuity of operations plan. There are not a lot around the Commonwealth. Um, the state has been fantastic in already communicating with us with the kinds of folks who can help us do that. So the gas disaster of September 13th um, was a you know, time we'll never forget. But we also came out of that realizing we were fortunate in some ways that the nature of the disaster did not directly impact our ability to help our residents through that difficult time. And a continuity of operations plan will help us identify weaknesses that we have in case a future disaster arises, where say the town hall is no longer in operation, or the police station or the fire station. How do we make sure that we continue to deliver services to our residents in, in the case of a, a disaster which impact those assets? The governor and lieutenant governor are very supportive of that initiative. There's not a lot of these around the Commonwealth, quite frankly. Uh, Chris McClure, our IT director, is going to spearhead that. But that's at the center of what we're going to do for our second community compact. This is to develop a, con a continuity of operations plan. Uh, it will certainly excel when, uh, well beyond my tenure here. At the end of that, there'll be training for leadership within the community on how to respond, some tabletop exercises to make sure that we implement it properly, and we're very excited about what's going to happen with that um, moving forward. So, so with that, I'll give you a lot of detail. Uh, I want to recognize that some uh, wonderful people. It's great to see you, by the way. Um, Christina Minicucci, who's our state rep, and um, we appreciate um, her being here as well, the new star, the senator, who's, who's always been supportive of the community, uh, and is always available, both are remarkably visible and available to the community. Appreciate it. The uh, chairman of the board of selectmen, Regina Key. Paul Lyon McShuttle is also here. I appreciate his attendance as well. Uh, select Community College Euros here. I think I've got everybody with that. I'd like to turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Carroll. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and to my colleagues in the legislature for joining us, and please add to the conversation. And really, the point here today is to thank all of you as municipal officials who come to this building to work in a public position in municipal government to better serve the people in this community. So first and foremost, thank you for your, your choice of career and your line of work. I value it a great deal, and I know Governor Baker does as well. Uh, I want to thank uh, Andrew Mailer for his leadership as a public official. 
uh, while uh, we came to know each other more so over the course of our first term of office, both the governor and me, uh, we really got to know each other um, <laughs> after the uh, terrible incidents now about uh, beginning five months ago. Uh, but I wanted to start there because when you think about the, the tragic circumstances of what happened on September 13th, when we came together on that night in the parking lot of the Showcase Cinema, we were not strangers. You know, uh, Manager Flanagan, uh, Manager Mailer, and uh, Mayor Rivera, uh, we all were familiar with one another because we worked hard over the course of the past three, four years building this relationship. So that in itself is such a valuable asset uh, that that there's a, a familiarity, a level of trust, and an engagement that when something really terrible happened, we were already way beyond that, <laughs> that, that point. And we were really able to then, from that team, build the plan and help the communities move forward. Uh, it's great to be back here today. Of course, as you know, we did a little shopping during our inaugural tour uh, during that weekend uh, just to just to express our gratitude to the businesses that were interrupted uh, during that time period and bring a few of our friends along with to, to buy a few things. We've enjoyed all of the things that we accumulated that day. Um, and it's great to be back here today on a weekday to see uh, a, a normalcy uh, that's here and certainly at Town Hall where you're focusing on the day-to-day -day stuff that, that you have to as a, as a municipality. Uh, as the, the manager said, uh, both the governor and I served in local government. He also served in the legislature for 10 years. It's very pleasant to know you, and I'm so happy that you have uh, coming through all the ranks of the legislature as well. And we wanted to make sure that we developed this relationship. And we started off with this community compact program about best practices. And we knew that it's, first of all, could not be a mandate, it had to be voluntary. And Andrew was one of the uh, municipal leaders that came to in this small work group to advise the governor and me about how to set up this program. And being a voluntary program of better practices and best strategies uh, to offer to communities to look at and consider. And what we found is that many communities would say was, well, we've always wanted to do this, but we just didn't have enough resource to get it started. So the compact then became a resource or a tool for communities to take issues that they wanted to study more so, take some seed monies from the state and the technical assistance from our uh, secretariats and agencies to then help you do that thing. Uh, and in many instances, it's around studying something or developing a plan and becoming a uh, a vehicle that you then can bring to your your uh, your local town meeting or to other stakeholders to get further engagement on. So all throughout the Commonwealth, and when I started on this journey four years ago, I didn't know that I would do this, but have had the opportunity to visit every city and town in the Commonwealth, all 351, and every single city and town signed up for best practices that they wanted to work on and signed a compact powerful that is. But more than that, the ability then for communities to share information around these plans and these discoveries and say, look, we took the seed money, we did this, then we applied for a MassWorks grant, and then we attracted a private investor. Now we're developing housing in an area that we really wanted and needed in town as an example of how the relationship turned into a planning document and then the communities have become so much smarter about taking advantage of state resources and literally stacking up a number of different grants that's adding up to a lot. So I have to say, I am so thrilled to now be able to roll into a new year and a new term of office to now build on this foundation that we have set with our communities throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, it's no surprise that North Andover being um, high achievers here have signed up, signed up for a second compact. Uh, there are 90 communities that are rolling into second compacts to study and do these kinds of things. So hugely powerful with the support of the legislature. Um, we'll 
to continue to fund this program so that it can be available. Uh, what we can do today with our time, if it's all right, I'd love to learn uh, from you about some of the things that you were able to do and some of the things that you might want to be working on that I can take back to our team and start to add more best practices uh, to our program. And also, I'm very pleased to say that in the first term, we were able to pass what's called Muni Mod 1. <laughs> and it was a great uh, coming together of our legislative friends, the community leaders. We got so many ideas from you about how we can change state statutes and peel off some of those uh, bureaucratic layers that were sort of interrupting your work. How many hours, how many pieces of paper, how much compliance that was totally unnecessary that we were able to kind of go like this with gone but there's more to do so we're going back for 2.0 yes. and uh, you can still share your That's information great, in your new position <laughs> uh, we're going to go back to all of you and say you know what are some of the things that we really want to get to and file another piece of legislation with our colleagues and go after some more red tape okay so keep that in mind too um, and share your information in the first round you did something really um, unique uh, a safe and uh, mobile future for older drivers. Is there anyone here that understands that in this yeah. practice and how that might have impacted the community? I did, the the um, director of the council on aging could not make it, but I can uh, briefly copy it was a, uh, I'm careful about what I say. <laughs> I'm not usually careful about what I say. So interesting enough, we compete for a parking lot, a parking lot. And we compete, meaning the employees here uh, compete with the folks that visit the senior center, which is connected to this building as well. We're building a new senior center. Uh, we have joke we're building a new senior center, so we don't compete with parking spots. Uh, but through that process and through other things we do, we, we do know that uh, for folks, uh, as they get older, they need increased training as well. So that's the feedback we got from the Council on Aging. It's the feedback we got from uh, people that we compete with parking spots out here. And so we happen to have a local company that kind of training, not only for young drivers, but for seniors as well. So it took, it took a unique step. It was actually at uh, what's called 1600 Oscar Landing. Uh, we had a professional company give training uh, to seniors. And that kind of training was the same kind of training given. This was not, you know, parked between the cones. They were putting on, you know, safety equipment and driving 75, 85 miles an hour or faster to learn how to sort of navigate those circumstances. It's a very well received program. I think we had 15 people originally signed up and got another 55 people to, to go later. So this was not uh, just you know how to safely park your vehicle. This was defensive driving and those kind of things. And it was very well received. It was unique. There's not a lot of programs like that. And I know we've had some additional interest since then. We think it's helped the parking circumstance out back. Uh, <laughs> But I think we may send you guys to training too. <laughs> may help there as well. We'll do a little bit of both. That was a, a pretty interesting program. And, and a further step beyond that for your council or your board to think about is taking advantage of another age friendly practice. I mean, a best practice around age friendliness and dementia friendliness as a community. Uh, you obviously care about your older residents, and that might be a designation that you'd like to obtain here. We're one of, I think, a handful of states in the country that have an age-friendly designation. Um, we, we have a Friends of Dementia group already That's with great. training ongoing. So, so. The, the other uh, idea was to not only just figure out how you can deliver services on your own, but how you can think about your community as a region and how you can work with your neighbors, which you've done so well, uh, on regional services. Are there any shared services that you have with another community. Uh, animal control officers, uh, so veteran our services. Our support coordinator is working on uh, a group with the Andover support coordinator as well as the YMCA and they're holding a weekly uh, parent group to address um, substance abuse and the opioid crisis and it's been very popular. How does that work? Is that funding from each one of your budgets or no, I believe, I believe that the Y gives them the space, and they, we provide the staff. So it's been it's been a great. I haven't had a chance to go to one. I do want to go to one just to see how it's working. But they work together closely. Uh, the Andover and the North Andover community support people to share resources. Okay. I was just in Bilberta, and the same issue came up. 
that it's, it's, there's a need for more mental health services and more social services, not just in schools, uh, not just through uh, public safety, public health, but with our older citizens as well, and that it become more of a uh, community uh, issue as opposed to just servicing one segment of your uh, population. And to figure out how to do that is difficult, but I think there's a real need for, for that. One of the things we proposed in our budget that's under consideration, and it came from your superintendents of schools, is to add more uh, social workers and counselors to the school districts. Uh, there's been obviously tragic circumstances around a school safety, and while it's important to think about hardening your assets to make buildings more secure, it's also important to think about who's in the building and if there are services that can be uh, supported to intervene and help and support someone that might have um, mental health issues. And certainly in our school districts, we're looking to do a, a whole lot more of that. Uh, the issue on emergency preparedness, I think uh, it was clear uh, that you had an ability to manage a crisis and that came from a strong leadership in this community and uh, in, in Lawrence and in Andover. Uh, what are some of the things that you think you might uh, do as part of this emergency plan? Uh, I know this is one of your best practices and I think it's one that if you take the step out to do this can become a model for other communities to adopt. So we want to thank you for pioneering in this area. Well, I'm going to put uh, Chris McClure on the spot. Uh, Chris McClure is our IT director and uh, the person who has not seen a good idea that he can't implement from a technology perspective. Um, and, and so Chris can talk a little bit about that, but we do see as an opportunity that eventually uh, we could broaden this as a best practice to not just locally but regionally. And I'd like to also, while I'm thinking about that, identify uh, and work with the identify the board of selectmen understood that what's changing in local government, dramatic change from aging myself some years ago is our need to provide or provide re provide resources which can assist in your mental health. That just isn't what local government did even 10 years ago. We had a really tragic circumstance in our housing authority here um, that resulted in uh, some people dying in essence from, from a mental health issue that we just, the housing authority wasn't prepared for and we just didn't have the resources to address. And I think the selectmen took the leadership role of adding someone who addresses or can respond to mental health issues. Everything from shut-in issues to issues that are the function of depression and related. So uh, Andover and North Andover have both identified the fact that this is now a need within the community. And, and I think the fact that we've both added resources with the leadership of both boards and now that those resources are working together uh, is a really fantastic addition. It's something how government is changing from we used to think about a nurse in town hall being in blood pressure. Today we're thinking about mental health services going out to the community. But we're well, yeah, going to sort of put this in the spot. And I thought, thought I was going past you there. Uh, if Chris could talk a little bit about the kind of operations plan in general, what we're trying to accomplish at the end. Sure. So I, I think one of the challenges that North Andover has is the concept of good to great, or in our case, we could say great to greater. Um, in that I think we do a lot really well. Um, and I think the focus here is really to sort of codify and make sure that's reproducible um, to the point that Andrew really uh, stressed to succession planning so that we can capture what we know, capture how we do things, uh, take the opportunity to look at things that could be improved and codify that in a way that can be continually improved into the future. <clears throat> so from a continuity standpoint, and IT is certainly, especially today, a huge component of that, just the amount of reliance we have on, on technology through continuity. Um, but just taking a step back, using the gas crisis as an opportunity to, to sort of study us at our best, but that good to great uh, model looking at where there are room for improvements, how can we capture some of the good things that we did so that they can be you know, reproduced or uh, avoided in the future. And that's really it, it's really studying and then writing, drafting a plan that can be maintained you know, into the future. To any of those, you don't have to, you don't have to emergency management, but, I, I I'm not. <laughs> but I would like to say that as a result of what happened in September, everybody really did come together, and I think it was a testament to Andrew, Andrew, and the mayor 
that they did have a working relationship to begin with, as you mentioned before. But I think that you know there was a, there's a process, obviously. Every time there was a need that would arise, it would be filled. And so I think by being able to go back and, and debrief and say, what did we do well? You know, what things came up that we never could have anticipated and start putting those down for future, because it's always great when you've got this great history in your head, but if you don't put it down, then you can't use it again. <laughs> you have to go dig back, we'll have to go hunt down Mr. Mailer and pull it out of his brain. But actually taking the time to put it down into a management plan, I think would be really helpful in the future because so many unexpected things came out that no no one ever could have anticipated. And you know, as you can continue to add to that, if anything ever happens in the future, you can also add to that. But I think it would make a really good base, a good good handbook, I guess, for the future. And hopefully if it exists, then nothing bad will actually ever happen. So <laughs> And one that's driven not by state government but by a community. Yeah, by a community. And so, so through your lens and that can be replicated, which is really Thank you for your, your support to the Compact Program and to the communities. Well, thank you for your partnership. I mean, it's absolutely amazing that you've been to 351 cities and towns and now are actually going around for the second lap <laughs> of the Commonwealth. So it's pretty amazing. But, uh, you know, I think that one of the important things here is that a lot of the services that we deliver as government generally get delivered in a way that touches people in, in the most intimate ways at the local level. And so police and fire protection, sanitation, those kind of things. And so for the recognition that you all made that we've got to strengthen those partnerships, you deserve a lot of credit. And then going around to try to strengthen those and respond to people who have been saying for years, hey, there's something we'd like to do, but we just haven't been able to get there. To be able to um, provide the ability to, to realize those dreams, those aspirations, is really important. And of course, it's always good when you come to North Andover because it is such a well-managed town really between the town administrator and the board of selectmen always continuously trying to improve it's great to come here and see what's happening a couple of thoughts though one of the things um, that i think was most noteworthy as we were all in that parking lot together on the third night of the 13th is how amazing it was to see the response unfold and how well coordinated it actually was on the part of public safety it was actually amazing for such a large scale event. But one of the things that followed from that, um, that I heard from a lot of people, is about the issue of inspectional services and about the, how the region and in, in many ways people from all over the state came to help at a time of need. And one of my takeaways from that was we need to think about in municipal modernization too, creating compacts to formalize so that people can have what amounts to a mutual aid agreement for inspectional services. Boards of Health have been doing it for a while. We could actually add it for inspectional services because there was a huge need and nothing could happen unless things got signed off on by a qualified inspector. And so trying to create some infrastructure on that for municipal modernization too, I think would be really, really important. Yes, I agree. And <laughs> then, Great point, because we did rely on these people coming from, from everywhere and they did a great great service and you didn't necessarily see them because they weren't on the front line so to speak as the public safety officials were but they were equally important in getting us back you know running again so well I think it's great that so soon after it happened you're recording uh, where things worked and where the gaps uh, did lie and then to memorialize that blueprint that we can we can work with you on so thank you for taking that on um, I just want to highlight we're in budget season as you are, and uh, this uh, this is the time we do file the budget. Uh, the governor uh, and I we uh, we take the first attempt at uh, putting the the budget together, and then the legislature has the benefit of more time and uh, insight into how revenue uh, collections are going as they prepare for the next fiscal year. Uh, there's two things I'd like to highlight that we. Uh, focused on in our budget as uh, something you can think about uh, that will impact your community as well. First of all, I do believe that this is the year of education. Uh, 25 years ago, we did something really important in this Commonwealth and we passed what was called education reform. I'm not sure where you were in your service at that time. I was five. <laughs> <laughs> you were in the house, you were in the house right? Uh, monumental and it was so needed because of the issue of social promotions and kids just going on to the next grade and not having a, 
proficiency and a readiness uh, to succeed by the time they graduated, and the need to have a shared way of funding education between local and state government. And so every form in 1993 was very profound in that it had accountability, a shared system of services, and then just standards baked into everything, and then a formula for the distribution of these funds uh, to reach communities based upon a number of demographics. Now here you are 25 years later, and we know that we need to adjust the formula because some of those factors are outdated. Uh, there are more communities with uh, English language learners and, and people of different poverty levels. We also have more children uh, with uh, special education needs, and you have higher costs relative to health care, pensions, and salaries. All that uh, requires us to uh, adjust the formula. Uh, the commission that reported this out uh, just a couple of years ago uh, made some very specific uh, recommendations to us and in our budget we fully fund those recommendations and we add additional dollars to target uh, those communities that have uh, more significant challenges in their schools. So over the course of the next five to seven years under our plan you'll see uh, combined with local government a $3 billion investment into our schools throughout this Commonwealth and in this budget that we recommend another $200 million above last year for Chapter 78 back to communities. Very, very important. And with my colleagues, the hope is, and I think this is where the urgency comes in and as local officials we will need to activate, is to finalize this formula and uh, the funds associated with it in this budget. Because the budget year begins fiscal in July, and if you're <coughs> still not finalized with the formula, then you will not have baked into next year's funding stream the new monies associated with public education. So I think collectively we all need to work hard over the upcoming months to make that a, a, prime, a priority. Uh, the other area is uh, the issue of municipal vulnerability regarding climate change. We have witnessed uh, over the past four years extremes in weather and what that impact is in communities. So adapting to these changes is really important. And I think about this as building and rebuilding smarter and stronger. Uh, we just can't simply do the same things we've done in terms of practices around construction uh, and expect that uh, the waters won't rise and the sea levels aren't rising and changing. It is. So we have a plan where uh, we would raise funds through an adjustment on the deed excise tax. That money would go into a fund specifically for municipalities to apply to, much like the MassWorks grant, to then uh, better protect properties in your community. So culverts, drainage systems, bridges, uh, roads that need reinforcement, sea walls if you're on the coastline. But this isn't a coastal issue, it's an every community issue. So I think there should be some real focus on being well prepared as a commonwealth and in your communities around um, vulnerabilities associated with climate change. And there's a plan and a program that we put out there for you to consider. So uh, this is going to be debated and discussed in, and hopefully uh, in the the way we do business in the Commonwealth will get you the best outcome on these initiatives. But um, certainly the partnership uh, and the appreciation for what you do, I hope that you feel today and just keep doing it. Uh, I know you're in transition and we are very grateful that uh, Andrew was going to come in and help the Commonwealth in a very important uh, position. Um, so while he remains connected to this community in one way, he's uh, going to be connected to us in another, and we are so grateful. So we wish you all the best in your transition. Please don't be so upset with me. <laughs> <laughs> but we knew uh, this talent would be would be needed uh, to help the Commonwealth. We're very grateful that he will, he's, he's decided to take that on. So uh, if there's anything else that you would like to share? Just a practical example to one thing that kind of got me said about climate change and the impact of the community. So uh, well, a hot topic along the Merrimack River is the, the CSOs and the outfalls of the, the Merrimack. Yes. Uh, associated typically with the research plants. I would say that 
you know, as part of the broader climate change discussion is the issue of stormwater management, yes. which is highly complex and quite frankly one of those things that gets discussed a lot in our you know public buildings but probably isn't widely known by the public. Yes. Um, there's increasing requirements to manage stormwater. Federal. Uh, federal requirements, complicated federal requirements. In the long run, some of those things will help address the CSO question, which means combined sewer overflows. It is drain water going into our sewage treatment plants that overwhelms those systems and when they get overwhelmed the back charge of the back foot what happens is sewage, raw sewage ends up in the river. And in the Merrimack Valley that's a significant issue all the way to the coast if you hear from the folks from Salisbury and Newburyport who end up um, receiving the product and I know it affects up and down the district so uh, the kinds of things that the Lieutenant Governor are talking about to address climate change whether you live along the coast of Working, working within coastal communities, and you may have issues in terms of just rising seawater, or you're, you're in Merrimack Valley. It affects everybody. Uh, we sometimes think it's only about coastal communities here, but it's not, and so it's a really important initiative moving forward. And I think uh, the leadership on that is uh, of particular importance. And as it relates to reform, it was not five, but um, <laughs> I started municipal government in 1993, right around that time. And, have worked in places that, that seemed to be, it seemed always to be a discussion of uh, those who were paying and those who were receiving. And I think one of the uh, goals of the commission and certainly embraced, and I know the legislature has a strong interest in this as well, is to eliminate that um, receiver or payer mentality that goes with ed reform, that it's about education, that all kids need to be educated equally and all communities need to realize that that education um, shouldn't treat you know communities in different ways and so we very much appreciate the leadership of that as well and know the legislature is sort of focused on that. So uh, with that we appreciate your coming. We always appreciate when you visit. Uh, even if I'm not here please come back and visit. I'll come with you. We'll make a deal. And bring money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Great. And we wish you a great great year ahead. But we'll be back. We have much to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.